Anyway, so we're talking about evil this morning, and, and that if, if God does exist and evil does exist, how can those two things be possible, right? How can those two things coexist and God still exist? And it's something that I think we all deeply, really struggle with. Uh, last week, I read an article on Yahoo News that dealt with parents who had a six-year-old daughter who was diagnosed with brain cancer. Um, she's got a brain tumor. Two weeks later, there's a picture up on the screen, two weeks later, their four-year-old son was diagnosed with the exact same brain tumor. I mean, you want to talk about being devastated. My world would be wrecked if my daughter and my son were both diagnosed with, with something like that. The father said this, he says, we broke down in tears. How could two kids in 14 days have the exact same tumor? How does that happen? And I think many of us, at least one point in time in our life, have asked, God, why do you permit suffering? Why do you allow evil? If this is the best possible universe that you could create, why is there so much that seems wrong with this world? Well, I think we're going to explore some answers this morning that hopefully we can bring some truth and some clarity and even some comfort to you this morning so that you can go and share this information with people who are out in the world. There was a famous philosopher named Epicurus, and he stated it like this, right? When he dealt with the problem of evil, he said, if, if God is willing to prevent evil but not able, then he is not all-powerful. If he is able to prevent evil but not willing, then he isn't loving. If he is both able and willing to prevent evil, why do we have evil? Is he neither able nor willing to prevent evil? Then why call him God? That resonates with us. He's frustrated with the fact that God proclaims to be all good, all powerful, just and right. Yet we look out in the world and we see so many things that seem unjust, that doesn't seem right. I mean, if God wants us to spend eternity in heaven with him, why didn't he just create heaven in the first place? Why do we have to go through this life in order to reach eternity with him where there is no suffering, there is no disease, there is no pain? Well, the problem with this theological argument that Epicurus presents is this. First of all, he was ignorant of what it means for God to be all-powerful and all-loving. You see, like him, many philosophers have misunderstood that God loves us. And God, in his love, will never force us to always do the right thing. Because if you force people to always do the right thing, you've eliminated their free will. And the relationship doesn't really matter. Because you force them to do it. And so God wants to give us free will. He wants to give us the ability to choose. And it is logically impossible for God to create a world in which everyone always is forced to freely choose the right thing. That's a logical inconsistency. So remember last week we talked about, it would be like saying this, God can create round squares. That doesn't make any sense, right? It's illogical. So if God is going to create a world in which free will is possible, it also has to be a world in which people can freely choose to do what? The wrong thing. They can choose to do evil. So he misunderstood what it means for God to be all-powerful and what it means for God to love us. He also misunderstood God's power. And so these are some underlying misunderstandings that we can bring to light. See, this theological proposition seems to be valid. It seems to be good. But when you start to challenge certain premises, you can understand that it is true that God exists and evil exists. And those statements are not incompatible with each other. C.S. Lewis, who was a famous Christian philosopher and apologist, he lost his wife to cancer. He wrote this. When it comes to suffering and pain and evil, he says, there's this sort of invisible blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says, or perhaps want to take it in. It is so uninteresting, yet I want others to know about me. I dread the moments when the house is empty, if only they would talk to one another and not to me. And so it is certainly true that evil does exist, and it is certainly true that we feel the ramifications and the effects of those evils. But here's the question that we're going to ask this morning. Is evil pointless? The suffering that you go through in this life, is it pointless? Is there no purpose to the pain? Does God not have a bigger plan that he's working out? 
and reflecting on his conversion to Christianity when C.S. Lewis, who experienced tremendous amount of pain and who was an atheist for a long part of his life, he also came to this conclusion that when he considered the problem of evil, when he considered the suffering that he went through, he said, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? And so I'd like to take you through a few things this morning about the perspective of evil in this world. And the first thing would be this. Our perspective on the problem of evil is finite. It is limited. We really don't see the big picture like God sees the big picture. There's a man in scripture, in fact, a whole book is written about him. Scholars do believe it's probably one of the oldest books in the Bible. And his name was Job. And Job had suffered a a tremendous amount of loss. He had lost his family. He had lost his house. He had lost his income, his livestock. I mean, the man had lost everything. And yet, Job was able to ask these questions in his suffering. In Job chapter 21, verse 22, he says, Can anyone teach knowledge to God since he judges those on high? And again in Job chapter 15, verse 8, Do you listen in on God's counsel or limit wisdom to yourself? In other words, who are we to be God's counselor? Who are we to say that we have the entire picture and we know that certain suffering is unjust and it has no purpose? You see, for the person who uses the problem of evil to say that there's no way God could exist alongside evil has to bear the burden of proof to prove that suffering is purposeless. And in order to do that, you've got to see the big picture. But as I said, what's the problem? Our perspective on on evil is finite. It's limited. We don't see everything there is to see. And much like Job, who lost everything, And even at points in his life, he cried out to God and he questioned, just like Jesus on the cross, God, why have you forsaken me? Job had enough wisdom to understand that God is at work. And even though we see only a small glimpse of the picture, God sees beginning and end. And so he's permitted this evil to take place in this life so that he can accomplish his purposes. You see, it can be certainly true that this suffering appears to be pointless in our limited scope. But because God sees the big picture, he is able to make the judgment call. I'm going to permit, not cause, I'm going to permit this evil to take place to work out my glory and my good for humankind. And I think this is something that we all know to be true, don't we? I think every person in this room has allowed themselves, permitted themselves or someone else to go through things that are tough, things that hurt, things that are evil for the greater good. Who likes to go to the dentist? Raise your hand if you like to go to the dentist because we are not friends anymore, okay? No, I'm just kidding. I, I don't really like going to the dentist. I mean, it's one of the worst things that I would actually choose to do on a day off. Hey, let me take a day of vacation to go get my teeth drilled on, right? Terrible. Ah, oh, I just can't stand the scratching and the noises and it just like nails on a chalkboard. No, ooh, I don't want that. But think about this. What if I were to say, well, I'm just never going to go to the dentist and I let my teeth rot? That would not be a very smart decision. So I actually have to go and allow myself to experience pain and suffering so that a greater good may be accomplished. And we have Novocaine. I mean, think about back in the 1960s. You know how much, like, you know, courage you'd have to pluck up to go to the the dentist back in the 1960s when they didn't really have Novocaine? I mean, that would be terrible. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, for Novocaine, you know, blessed up. But our perspective on the problem of evil is finite, and we do permit ourselves to experience suffering and evil for the greater good. And so I imagine God does the same thing. Now, as a little child who hated to go to the dentist, I not only had a limited perspective um, of, of evil, but also my picture of evil was fragmented. You ever see a picture and there's certain parts that's so pixelated you, you really can't make out what the image is? Or have you ever had a picture and the painting was only halfway done? Well, that's the same kind of idea of our perspective in this life. As we're looking at a painting that's not finished all the way, we don't see the beginning and the end. Let me give you a perfect example. I've got a picture up on the screen for you of a heavyset man. Now, most of us would look at a guy that was 300 pounds and we would say, wow, this individual is very unhealthy and it looks like he's not in good shape. That's the information that we get. That's the problem of evil. But let's take a step back. And now let's complete the picture. So look at this next picture for you. Now let's understand, I've used this illustration before, now let's understand that he's a professional sumo wrestler. 
And he's a world champion. And that he's actually not as unhealthy as we would imagine. Do you see how our perspective on the person changes when we include more information into the scenario? Now, I would fully admit that if we were to only look at the problem of evil, I think there is good reason to believe that God doesn't exist if that's the only thing that we look at. But when we get background information about good arguments for the existence of God, now it starts to paint a clearer picture. We get more information, and now we can start to rationalize and understand a better perspective on the problem of evil. So what should we look at? Well, for instance, I've got a few arguments that would be up on the screen for you of some good background information. Two weeks ago, Matt talked about the cosmological argument. Now, I'm not expecting many of you to know everything there is to know about these arguments, but they're in your notes if you've downloaded our app. They're in the notes section, and you can go on your own time and in your own research, and you can begin to look at some of these arguments that are good uh, proofs in the general sense for the existence of God. And when you have a lot of this evidence that mounts up, that shows that it is probably better to believe that God exists than not, now we get a little bit more perspective to our pain. And so we can paint this picture and we can complete the picture and we can say, ah, God, I understand what you're doing. I get it now. I understand why you let me go through that pain in the past. I understand now why you let certain moral atrocities take place because you are working out your goodness. And so the key phrase that I would focus in on is this. When we discover that God exists, and that Christianity is true, we have a better background to provide perspective to understand why God permits evil. And so the question I asked you this morning, what are some good reasons why God may permit evil? I mean, God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. Are there any good reasons why God may permit the things that we go through? Isaiah puts it like this. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways are your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Well, the first thing that we're going to talk about is something that we've already briefly discussed, and that is free will. God wants creatures who freely choose to love him. And it isn't very loving to force someone to love and choose you. So if we can freely choose to love and accept God, we can also freely choose to reject God and to hate him. And to disobey his commands. And so it is better that we make decisions that actually matter. And that is grounded in our ability to choose. Now free will is not the ability to choose between apples and oranges. Free will is has anyone caused you to choose apples? Has anyone caused you or anything caused you to choose oranges? Uh, uh, an illustration for you to bring this point home. Say that you uh, are a grand scientist and you want everyone that you know to vote for Larry Hogan. And so you capture a guy, you throw him in your van. I know, it's kind of creepy. And you take him home and you insert these little electrodes in his brain for the election. And that every time he goes to vote for somebody other than Larry Hogan, he would get a shock in his brain and he would immediately vote for Larry Hogan for the governor of Maryland. Okay, let's just say that that's what you decided to do. So sure enough, the election comes up, he goes into the election office and he votes for Larry Hogan. Now he wasn't caused to vote for Larry Hogan. He still freely chose to vote for him. That's, the, that's what free will is. It's not being caused to do something. It's not the choice between A and B or apples and oranges. And so God wants us to freely choose him without being forced to choose him. That's one of the reasons why God may permit evil in this world. Joshua says this in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. He says, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your forefathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And everybody in this room can make the free will decision to choose or reject God. That is up to you. Another good reason why God may permit evil would be this. He wants to have fellowship with us. And we know that we seek God through experiencing suffering. Now that isn't the case for everyone. But I was able to just talk to a couple this week who said, if really, if it wasn't for some of these things happening in our life, we probably wouldn't be in church. And it was actually the bad things that happened in our life that caused us to come back into church and try to have a relationship with God. We felt like God was saying, I want a relationship with you. 
And we find that to be true in the Bible as well. The psalmist writer put it like this in Psalms 119, verse 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statues. And I think for those of us who have experienced life for any amount of time, can look back to the areas in our life where we have suffered, where things have went wrong, and we can see the hand of God at work in our life. Now it's equally true that probably for many of us there are things that we look that hurt and we don't understand. God, why did I have to go through that? And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're experiencing pain and suffering and evil and you are like walking through a cloud and you just don't understand what God is doing and why he would let you go through this. God wants fellowship with you. And ultimately, that's what everything in our life is working towards, to know God. That may be a reason why God permits evil. Number three, another reason why God permits evil is character formation. Some of our most important character-forming features can happen when we develop them through suffering and pain. And you know what's funny is that sometimes a lot of the suffering comes from our own stupid decisions. Amen, I can testify. (laughs) Some of my greatest learning moments have been from areas of my life where I've made really stupid mistakes. And sometimes they're not sinful, not black and white. Point to a scripture and yes, you sinned right there. Sometimes they've just been really unwise decisions. And if it wouldn't have been for those unwise decisions, I probably would not have learned my lesson the way that I did. And so we get to form our character and grow in our Christian maturity through our suffering. And so if you are suffering, or when you do suffer in the future, here's the question you need to challenge yourself with. Am I going to formulate the character that God wants me to, or am I going to have to keep going through this over and over again until I learn my lesson? Me? I'm like, let me just learn this real quick. Or God, can you provide another way to teach me? Because I really don't want to have to go through that. James puts it like this. He says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God wants you to run the race with endurance. He wants you to grow stronger And the only way he can do that is through conflict and through trials. That's how he develops our character. And so instead of blaming God for the evil, accept it, that God has permitted it to touch your life so that you may know him more and you may be a stronger person for it. And then fourthly and finally, I think another good reason why God may permit evil is this, an eternal appreciation of heaven. I mean, how can we really appreciate wealth without poverty or health without sickness or much without less? And so God allows us to go through these things so that maybe when we get to heaven and we experience the new heavens and the new earth, we may be in total appreciation of them forever. Me personally, I do believe that we will have free will in heaven and we will always choose to freely do the right thing because we'll have a renewed nature We'll be in the presence of the Father, and we will look back on this human experience, and we will say, I am never going back to that. When we see the judgment of God, and we reflect on our life here on this earth, we will fully and utterly and always appreciate heaven to the greatest possibility. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. What we go through right now has nothing on what we're going to go through with God in heaven forever. It is going to be glorious. It is going to be incredible. It is going to be the most amazing experience that your minds really can't fathom or or wrap around. Neither can I. But that's what the Bible promises. And so here are, those are four good reasons why God may permit evil. But we also need to consider this. We need to consider that Christianity teaches certain doctrines about the problem of evil and the, per- and the perspective on our pain. And I'd like to share those with you this morning as well. It really does help provide perspective because we do believe that God exists. We do believe that Christianity is true. And we do believe that what the Bible says about us is accurate. And the first thing that the Bible says about this idea of our perspective on pain is this. The chief purpose in life is not happiness. The chief purpose in life is not our happiness. Christianity teaches us that the chief purpose in life is to know God. And so if you have 
believe the lie that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy and wise and that God only cares about how, uh, how happy you are, you've kind of missed the boat on that. God wants a relationship with you, and sometimes that comes at a cost to your misery. I mean, think about it. Think about what led you here to this place. Think about what was going on in your life, the things that, have, that went wrong to lead you to this point, to seek out God and a relationship with the church family. I think many of us could look back on our lives and say, man, I actually had to go through some things that really weren't enjoyable or pleasant, but now I have that relationship with God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 10 says this, God disciplines us for our own good so that, he may sh- so that we may share in his holiness. Again, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, the conclusion where when all has been heard is this, fear God, keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. God is working in your life in such a way that he wants a relationship with you, and sometimes that comes at a cost to your personal happiness. It comes at a cost to giving up certain sins that you find enjoyable. It comes at a cost of giving up certain materials that you desperately want and sacrificing them to give generously to the Lord. I mean, sometimes it comes at a cost, and I would even be willing to say this. If you haven't given up anything to be in a relationship with God, you may want to question the authenticity of your relationship. God is not primarily interested in your happiness, but your holiness and a relationship with him. Now, does that mean that God wants you to be miserable? Absolutely not. Look, God wants you to enjoy this life even more than you do. But God does permit evil in our lives, and I think that there's a good reason for it. If we were to ask the Apostle Paul, Paul, why did God let you suffer? Why did he let you be beat and stripped naked and almost drowned and imprisoned and stoned to the point where you were dead and you came back to life? I mean, Paul, why would God let you go through this? You've lost everything for the Lord. This is what I think Paul would say in Philippians chapter 4. He says, I suffer because I want to know Jesus. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. God lets me suffer that I may know Jesus and the sufferings that he went through and that I may live with him at the resurrection of the dead. So that is, that is a key doctrine that God wants us to know him and be in a relationship with him. C.S. Lewis wrote this, We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God wants a relationship with us. The second doctrine that I would point out is this. Mankind is in a state of rebellion against God and his purpose. That's what the Bible says. God did create a perfect world. He did give man free will, but man chose to reject him. Man chose to sin. Humans do terrible evils, and this is what the Bible says. Look, if you think that you're a good person, by your own standards, you probably are. But the Bible says that you're a sinner. The Bible says that I'm a sinner and that the world went wrong. And shows evil and to do terrible things. Romans 3.23 puts it like this. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 5.12. Therefore just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all men sin. It wasn't God's plan and purpose for man to choose evil. But he had to permit it. And he was able to work out his greater plan and his greater good for the redemption of humanity. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And that the most terrible evil that we experience in this world is as a direct result of the evil actions of the people around us and our own evil actions as well. That's what the Bible teaches. So God has given us the freedom to choose, which includes the freedom to do evil. And it's not logically possible for God to create a world in which he forces everyone to freely choose to do the right thing. We've said that a few times. So what's the point? The point is this. The Bible is very clear. Man chose rebellion against God and we reap upon ourselves the evil that we experience in the realm of morality. Another doctrine that I'd focus in on is this. We are not alone in our suffering and God loves us through our suffering. You see, in most of the world religions, God is some abstract idea floating off in an eternal removed paradise as he sits back and he watches us suffer. Or, even more so, God, or many gods, actually cause us to suffer. 
And some take pleasure in our suffering. But that is not what the Bible teaches. God is not some lofty being far removed up in the heavens. But the Bible says that God suffers with us. He experiences our suffering. He has went through the things that we go through. One of the most beautiful passages of scripture is Isaiah 53 verses 3 through 5. It says this. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. Yet we did not esteem him. And then look at this. One of the most important revolutionary scriptures in the entire Old Testament was looking forward to the Messiah. And look what it says here in verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Jesus didn't just die on the cross for our sins. He carried our sorrows and our griefs. Somehow, supernaturally, through the passion story, through the experience of his beatings and his sufferings and in his, his crucifixion, ultimately, through his humiliation, he was able to experience not just the penalty for your sins, but the very emotional, mental, psychological suffering of grief and sorrow that we all carry. You ever lost a child? God understands what you go through. You ever been sexually abused? Jesus was stripped naked, had his face covered, and was beaten in front of everyone. God understands. You ever been divorced and been separated? God experiences that. He knows what that feels like. You ever been humiliated and mocked and insulted? He was spit in his face and punched and laughed at. He hung on a cross naked before the entire Jerusalem. I mean, you want to talk about humiliation. God understands what you go through. And that's why Christianity is not just intellectually true, but it's emotionally true. It not only satisfies the desires of the mind, but it cures the healing of the heart, knowing that we have a God who is not far removed, but who has walked through our shoes and understands what we go through. You see, God didn't just allow this world to go through suffering. He became a part of it, and he didn't deserve any of it. A very important doctrine of Christianity C.S. Lewis wrote this in A Grief Observed. He says, when you're happy and so happy you have no sense of needing him, speaking of God, so happy that you are tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. In other words, when things are going great, God, I love you. Thank you for being my God. He says, but go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is in vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, and a sound of a bolting and double bolting on the inside, and after that, silence. I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer, for you yourself are the answer. Before your face questions die, what other answer would suffice? The cross is the ultimate answer to our pain and to our suffering. It's when God came down and suffered, not just for us, but with us. Another doctrine that I would focus in on, the fourth one would be this. God's purpose is not restricted to this life, but spills beyond the grave into eternal life. This isn't all there is. There's far much more to be experienced. I mean, we're talking about a potential infinite, eternity, forever and ever. And that this world and our life is just one small dot on a very long line that stretches a very long way. You see, God wants us to experience eternal life with him, and he wants us to have joy for eternity over and over again. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. He says, do not lose heart. When you go through challenges in this life, do not lose heart. Don't give up. But though our outer man is decaying, and some of you could give an amen to that, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. You say, yeah, my body feels older, but I I don't feel older on the inside. Yeah, my body feels broken, but I just feel as young as I've ever been. That's what Paul was saying. Even though we go through crap in this life that hurts, our inner side, our inner man is renewing every day. He says this, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Far beyond all comparison. 
And while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. There is much more to this painting. There is much more to this story than the life we experience and the pain that we go through. And Paul says, God is working through your pain an eternal weight of glory. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't give in. Keep pushing forward. And so as we wait for eternity, we can prepare ourselves through certain ways, through, through certain things. And so this morning, what should you do? How should you leave this auditorium with your perspective on pain? Well, let me just briefly recap what we've talked about this morning. Number one, remember that our perspective on evil is finite. You're limited. You can't see it all. Number two, remember that our picture of evil is fragmented. We only get certain pieces of the story. And so we have limited understanding and we have limited perspective. Number three, accept the background information on the fact that God exists when considering evil in the world. Look at the evidence for God's existence and allow that background information, just like the sumo wrestler, help explain this idea of the problem of evil. Number four, consider the reasons why God may permit evil. We went through four of them this morning. You can access those if you've forgotten them. You can access those on our Southern Christian Church app. Um, you can download the notes, and you can actually type in notes if you want to as well. And number five, understand the doctrines of Christianity. Mankind rebelled against God, yet God chose to love mankind through our rebellion and ultimately redeem us for eternity. And so there are three things that I'd like for you to do if you are going through evil or experiencing suffering or you know someone who is. Number one, keep on rejoicing. Praise God, trust God, love God, don't give up, keep on rejoicing. Rejoicing is an attitude, it's a willful decision, it's not an emotion of the heart. At times you can feel it in your heart, at times you feel joyful, but nevertheless, keep on rejoicing. Give God, give God, give God thanks. This is what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13. He said, but to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. As you go through life, and at times when life stinks, keep on rejoicing, so that when Jesus comes, you can rejoice with him. Don't give up. Number two, comfort others. Take the initiative and use your story to bring healing to those around you. One of my favorite verses on this is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Paul writes this, Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. This word comfort comes from the Greek word parakaleo. It's a legal term. It means to have an attorney come stand beside you and present evidence in the court of God. Now think about that. When you comfort others, the Bible says come alongside them and point out the evidence of God's comfort. Point out the sacred truths. Sometimes our emotions and our feelings will override what we know to be true because the pain runs so deep. And we desperately need people who are willing to come alongside others and say, I'm not just going to point at you about your pain, but I'm going to be walking with you through your pain, just like Christ is walking through my pain with me. Comfort others. Give them the comfort that you've received from God. So keep on rejoicing. Comfort others with the comfort of Christ. And then number three, give answers. You see, there's two approaches to the problem of evil. One is emotional, which needs pastoral counseling. It needs comfort. It needs healing. The other one is intellectual. Some people could care less about the suffering in the world, but they can't overcome the intellectual hurdle of why God would permit evil. And so be prepared to give answers, just like we went through this morning intelligent, rational, factual-based answers. Peter put it like this. Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you with gentleness and with reverence. Always be ready to give an answer for why God may permit evil and suffering in this world. I was listening to a debate between two Christian philosophers um, you know, the Bible is filled with some messy stories, 
But just because the Bible talks about the evil things that men has done does not mean that God promotes those things. So it's one of the ways we know the Bible is true because if you look at ancient documents, people will lie to cover up humiliation of their heroes, so to speak. And the Bible doesn't do that. Look, you cannot find a leader in Scripture that hasn't made some of the most terrible mistakes today. And I think the Christian church, uh, unfortunately true, has got a really bad reputation for trying to hold other people to this impossible idea of perfection. The Apostle Paul sanctioned the murder of people, threw people in prison. Peter lied and denied Christ. He was actually rebuked in Galatians chapter 2. Um, he was being prejudiced against non-Jews. He wasn't eating and fellowshipping with them when the Jews were in town. I mean, you go through the leaders in the church or even the Old Testament leaders like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon. These guys, their lives are riddled with mistakes. Well, I was listening to these two philosophers on, uh, on a Christian radio that I listened to. as a podcast. It's, it's excellent. And they have different perspectives on why God commanded certain evil things, as so it seems, in the Old Testament. And uh, one of the philosopher's names is, is Paul Copen. And the other guy, I can't really remember his name, but his story stuck with me, and I'd like to share it with you this morning. He wrote this really large volume on the reason why God permits evil um, in the Bible and in this world, and why there are certain, what seem to be really hard stories to accept when you read the Old Testament specifically. And he has a certain theory, what he calls the crucible view. It's that we have to look at everything in the Old Testament through the crucifixion. And so he had written this two-volume work. He actually has a shorter work as well for people that don't want to go through all the information. And not too long after, he's telling this story on the radio that he received a call from uh, a few parents that had read his work. And they weren't able to have children, and so they became a foster family. And sure enough, they had uh, fostered this four-year-old girl and pardoned the, uh, I guess you could say, graphic nature of the um, of the story. But this four-year-old girl, one of the things that she would do is every single night she would wake up and she would defecate herself. And she would take that and she would put it on the walls. And they couldn't understand why she would do that. I mean, imagine yourself doing the loving thing and fostering this four-year-old girl and you get her and you have this wonderful home and she does something like this and she wouldn't stop. And, and so they're telling this story to this guy who wrote this book. They're telling this story that instead of finding a new home for her and getting her out of her house, we decided to sit down and ask her, why are you doing this? And she wouldn't give them an answer. And so they said, you know what we'll do? We understand this is something that, that you want to do and that it makes you feel safe and comfortable. So we're going to help you. And they took a little area out on the wall and... They covered it, and they would put gloves on their hands, and they would help her smear that all over the wall. And they did that week in and week out every single night. Until finally, she trusted them enough to share why she did what she did. And this beautiful little angel, this smart, wonderful girl, was being sexually abused by her father every night. And she found out the only way to prevent him to stop was one night he came into the room and she was so scared that she did that. And every night before she went to bed, she would do that to prevent herself from being hurt anymore. And those people put those gloves on every night. They got down in the messiness of this girl's world. They didn't cast judgment on her. They didn't throw her out. They met with her. They sympathized with her and her suffering. And they brought healing to her heart. And that's exactly what the cross does for us that God has come down in the messiness of this life and he's put on the gloves and he's smeared his reputation and he became a curse, the Bible says, utter humiliation that he may bring healing to us. That is the ultimate perspective on our pain is through the cross. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, if you've been suffering and there have been things that have happened in your life that has caused you to ask God why, and you've been angry with God, understand that God is angry with what you've went through too. And he died for it so that he could suffer with you. We're going to sing a song of invitation, and we're going to invite anybody here who wants to accept a relationship with Jesus by repenting of their sin, placing your trust in him, and being baptized for the remission of your sins. We're going to invite you to do that now. Would you stand and pray with me? Have you ever
心的我。